So first of all, I want to thank uh, Jenny for inviting me and Adam and the whole Creative Mornings crew. Um, obviously, Alchemy Chickmunk keeping us fueled in 1909 for, for having us. Um, but I want to thank all of you for coming today uh, and supporting this awesome organization and, and for each of you for, for making our community you know, more vibrant every day. I see some familiar faces here uh, in the audience, which is really cool. Um, so I wanted to start out today by talking to you guys a little bit about my story, because I think our stories are so important uh, to who we are and to what we believe. So me, I have always been drawn to nature. Ever since the first time that I was handed a pair of binoculars, I wanted to learn more about the wondrous things that I was seeing in a new way. You know, these, these colorful songbirds or the, the bill of a woodpecker as it slams its head against the side of a pine. And this love and curiosity for nature was cultivated by my parents, a scientist and, uh, and an educator. And they would haul me and my sister and my brother all over the eastern seaboards to campgrounds uh, on the coast of Maine and the Florida Keys, the rolling valleys uh, of the Appalachians, and the bottomlands of the Deep South. And now in 2001, I'd meet my wife, Kristen, who's my soulmate, and she's my constant exploration companion. And about eight years ago, we really kicked our love of travel into high gear. And we traded flights out west to see the big trees and up north to continue to explore those down east coast of Maine that I did as a child and, and on which she grew up. And we started doing these annual cross-country road trips, the goal to try to find the wildest places outside of Florida. You know, these places that would conjure these memories of my parents reading to me where the wild things are as I lay in bed. Now, while all this exploring was going on, my career was kind of going along as I'd imagined until over my 30s, um, this significant obsession with fishing started to morph a little bit into this obsession with capturing these moments of, of beauty and wonder with a camera. And now, you know, those of us with at least a few grays in our hair, you all know that throughout the course of our careers and our lives, there's so many different like twists and turns. And, and one of those turns several years back took all of my passions, you know, for, for nature, for science, for photography, and for sharing these experiences with others and melded them all into this, this job that I have now. And I think my mom said it best in a recent birthday message. And she said that uh, this little boy who followed his destiny and somehow made using cameras and binoculars a career. So now, as we go through our lives, there are these certain moments that, that help shape us, right? Um, that help guide us to different interests and places and cultures and people. And for me, two of those were vacations when I was little to Florida. And one of those vacations took us to the Everglades and the Okefenokee Swamp, and the other to the Florida Keys. On those vacations when I was small, I was so captivated by those tannin-stained waters of the swamps and the lowlands, of you know, these forests that were just dripping with epiphytes, and of the water that was home to these modern-day dinosaurs. And I was also captivated by those sapphire blue waters of the Gulf Stream and all of these colorful characters that called those waters home. And so, you know, it was no surprise that when my folks moved us back down here, I'm a Florida native, um, spent some time in Northern Virginia, and when they moved us back down here in the mid-90s, it was no surprise that instantly I knew that the Palm Beaches were my place. It was the place that, that I wanted to call home because nowhere had I imagined that those tannin-stained, sinuous blackwater rivers 
would flow right out into those blue ocean waters that skirt the coastline. So today, I want to share with you guys some of the special places and some of the characters that still inspire that creativity and that wonder and that connection to nature today uh, and places that are right in our backyard. So my letter, love letter to the Palm Beaches. Now, what keeps me inspired um, about this connection to nature is the scientific discoveries that have happened just in the last 25 years since the first time I, I stepped foot on this land. You know, I think it's so easy to become complacent uh, nowadays, especially with technology and this age of, you know, instant answers in our pocket. But, you know, I'm here this morning to remind you all that we have so much more to learn. Like about the swallow-tailed kite. So these amazing birds used to span all the way up the Mississippi River floodplain. They bred in, in 21 states. Now today, that range is contracted by about 80%. And now they breed in seven states, but most of the breeding population is right here in Florida. But what gives me hope is some awesome scientists like the folks at Avian Research and Conservation Institute are partnering with our Palm Beach County Natural Area staff and placing these uh, GPS trackers on these birds to further understand how these birds utilize that, the landscape here locally, but also how they utilize the landscape on their epic 10,000 mile round trip migra migration to southern Brazil and back every single year. I love these birds. These are travelers, I love to travel, and these are some of the most social raptors in the bird world. So when they nest, like they are right now, in our natural areas, in our public lands, they nest in these neighborhoods of, of three to five groups. And then when they fledge their chicks out, like they're getting ready to do right now, before their migration south to Brazil, they stage in these amazing communal roosts where these huge groups of birds gather uh, at night for shelter and safety. The largest of these counts over 2,000 birds in a single area in the western Everglades. Now it's at these times though that these birds are really vulnerable to disturbance, like a roost was in the east central part of our state about eight years ago. So in that particular roost there was this unethical photography tour operator and they were running airboats and helicopters uh, right next to this roost and they would take clients out and they would intentionally flush hundreds of birds over and over again so that these photographers could you know, get the shot. So unsurprisingly, that roost was abandoned. But biologists think that that was about the same time that another one of these roosts showed up on secluded Palm Beach County natural area land a couple of years later. And I'm really happy to report that last year, that roost right in our backyard hosted over 500 birds and lists as one of the extraordinarily important places that these birds rely on every year. So further technological advances are allowing scientists to put trackers on even the smallest songbirds. You know, these tiny but colorful neighbors of ours that move through our forests and our swamps and our prairies every year during migration. You know, these tiny little birds of almost every color call our backyards home on their journeys, like the Cape May warbler. So this beautiful yellow and rusty orange bird is a long distance migrant. These birds nest in the, in the spruce forests up in Canada and the very northern reaches of New Hampshire and Vermont and Maine. And they nest in the very, very tops of these trees and they spend almost all of their time in the canopy searching for these little spruce budworms that they feed their chicks in the nest. The science only described their nests 30 years ago and still today, Almost nothing is known about their courtship rituals. So when these birds fledge out their tiny little chicks, they make this epic migration all the way down to the Caribbean in the east coast of Central America in the winter. And there's so many of these other relatives of the Cape May warbler, these other wood warblers, that join them in, in these epic migrations based on their size. Okay, so these birds, they weigh maybe half an ounce 
So to give you an idea, that's, that's about the weight of a pencil. But they make these unbelievable journeys. And science is discovering some of the ways that they do that. So these birds on their journeys, they navigate by being able to sense the magnetic field of the Earth, kind of like a compass. And they can also, recent discoveries have shown, detect polarized light. And what that means is that these birds can navigate by the sun even at night when they can't see the sun. And when a lot of these birds move down the east coast of the U.S. and they take off or take off from the peninsula of Florida, they're going to fly for thousands of miles in one shot over a few days. And how do they do that? How do they sleep? Well, they turn each side of their brain off alternately for a few seconds at a time. All the while, they're still navigating to these precise locations in these distant lands. So if you think those flights are impressive, let's talk about our shorebirds. Okay, these are birds that make the longest distance migrations on the planet for any land bird. And science is now uncovering these amazing stories about these animals, like superhuman abilities, that so many of us, you know, these are animals we take for granted as they forage like tiny little sewing machines right in the wave wash. These sanderlings and the ruddy turnstones call our beaches home during the winter. And like many of those other shorebirds that make these unbelievable migrations, they enter this stage called hyperphagia uh, before they take off kind of like bears do before hibernation. So they're gorging themselves with food to layer on fat and muscle that they'll then metabolize on their flights over several thousands of miles all the way to the Arctic in one shot. And what's amazing about these birds, I wish I had some of these traits. In two weeks before they take off, some of these birds will double their weight in two weeks. And in the few days before they take off, they'll actually shrink their digestive tract to save weight for their flight, only to almost immediately regrow that system when they land because they have to start feeding right away if they have any hope of breeding in these very short Arctic summers. So now, if some of these things are blowing your mind like they do mine, I cannot wait for you guys to start doing your own research about some of our other charismatic animal friends here locally like the black skimmer. So these birds fly right above the surface of the water and they drag their lower bill through the water, snapping up anything that comes in their path. Or the American oyster catcher. Now these shorebirds have this really robust looking orange beak from the side, but when you look at them head on, it looks almost like a shucking knife because of what they eat, oysters and clams. And what's really cool is these rare bird species are now raising young every year in Lake Worth Lagoon, the water body that's only a few hundred yards from where we're sitting today. And they're able to do that because of restoration efforts by Palm Beach County ERM and, and our partners here locally and the support of the community. All right, so here's what really sounds like a fairy tale. I promise you this is all true. This is brand new research, you know, over the past couple of decades. Do you all know that trees can communicate and share resources? So did you know that trees can warn their neighbors of coming insect invasions? And old growth trees in the forest can actually share nutrients and carbon and even water with surrounding saplings and other bushes and trees in times of need. And they do this through this expansive network of subterranean fungi that connect the entire forest into this one living community. Or that those old growth trees, when they die, they can actually send their carbon resources to their neighbors and give them an energy boost so that when those giants fall, their neighbors can come in and fill the void in that canopy. All right, so one last example, and this is one of my favorites. I'm a swamp guy through and through. And these cryptic creatures of the swamp are animals that almost none of our 21 and a half million residents in Florida even know exist. So I'm talking about our giant salamanders, the greater siren and the two-toed amphiuma. 
And now these are secretive animals that live down in the mud in the swamps. And science still knows very little about these animals. These animals that sing at night, and they're, they're extraordinarily slimy. And when the water drops in their swamps, they can actually make this slime cocoon and estivate for years at a time sometimes, essentially going dormant, waiting for the rains and the water to return. But what's funny is, even though we don't know much about these animals, humans have been intimately connected to these creatures for thousands and thousands of years. So our county archaeologist, Chris Davenport, right now is shattering what we thought we knew about Native American history here in Florida. And many of his excavations include thousands and thousands of amphiuma and siren bones. So these animals were obviously a really important food source for the early humans who inhabited wild Florida. Now we've known for some time that humans have lived in Florida for some 12,000 years, right? I mean, when they first showed up, they were walking amongst dire wolves and, and mammoths and saber-toothed cats. But the best archeologists of only 20 to 30 years ago they posited that at the time of European contact, about 500 years ago, that there was probably somewhere in the 10 to 30,000 Native Americans living in Florida. But the new discoveries that Chris and his colleagues are making are showing that the interior of the state, and especially the Everglades, these weren't just grocery stores and trade routes for Native Americans. They were home to these thriving communities. And so now Chris and his colleagues are estimating there was likely more around up to a million Native Americans at the time of European contact. I mean, think about that. You know, Florida's population didn't hit that level again for 400 years. So I love to remind people and talk to people about these new discoveries because I think it highlights something that we've lost over the last couple hundred years. And that is the realization that we are nature. Okay, nature is us. And whether we realize it or not, we are intimately connected and intertwined and in affecting the natural rhythms of the earth. You know, sometimes I wonder how those ancient people would feel about how we've stewarded the land. You know, I wonder what else is out there to be discovered. What else we might learn that might make us think we should stop saying real confidently, you know, we used to think, but now we know. And maybe start saying, we used to think, but now we think. And I wonder if we're really ready to start thinking about what we want the future of wild Florida to look like. So I came here this morning to thank you all for supporting Palm Beach County's natural areas. If you don't know what they are, please come and ask me afterwards. Um, for supporting our public lands and for conservation initiatives in the place that we call home. But I also came here to implore you all to be curious. You know, please wonder. Please wonder what's around the next bend in the trail. Please wonder what's between the river and the sea. Please wonder what's under your feet, under the water, as you stroll along the boardwalk. And know that that wonder is only realized when we explore the land. And also know that when we build more and more malls and condos and streets and roads and parking lots, that all of that wonder is sealed away from us. I'm here to ask you to explore, to go explore wild Florida and pull your friends, your neighbors, your mom, your dad, your kids, your grandkids, your nieces and nephews with you into wild Florida. Teach them how to wonder, or maybe remind them what wondering feels like. You know, there is so much more out there to learn, and it's up to all of us, not just to steward the land that is here for us now, but also to steward the land for all the generations that have yet to wonder. Thank you, guys.
So we've got a few resources up here. Um, start your adventure. We did a documentary film. I think you all would be introduced to your backyard in a really new way. It's called Hidden Wild. You can stream it anytime, hiddenwildfilm.com. It's only 26 minutes long. We took three local teens, and we took them 70 miles in seven days hiking, biking, and paddling in our connected wilderness. Um, pbcnaturalareas.com, you can find the natural area near you, where to go explore. Uh, and then we've got an adventure series that we do for free um, that I think We're Adam's got a, a link for yeah. it. Yeah. QR yeah. code you guys can scan. But. Um, so we do free adventures. Please come out and explore with us. If you don't feel comfortable coming out into the wild, you can sign up for free and we'll guide you, make sure you're safe, and get you connected to nature. Thank you. Yeah. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Benji. Um,